Our next speaker earned his Doctor of Medicine at the St. Luke's College of Medicine, William H. Quasha Memorial. He finished his residency at the Anatomic and Clinical Pathology Institute of Pathology, St. Luke's Medical Center. He then had fellowship training in Urological Genitourinary Pathology at the Department of Pathology the Johns Hopkins Hospital, Baltimore, Maryland, USA under his mentor, Dr. Jonathan I. Epstein. He then presented and had numerous lectures from various societies, institutions, and hospitals locally and abroad. He is the current chairman of the Department of Pathology, St. Luke's Medical Center, College of Medicine, uh, William H. Quasha Memorial, and Section Head Histopathology Institute of Pathology, St. Luke's Medical Center, Quezon City. He is the past head and chairman of the Institute of Pathology of the same institution. Let us now welcome our next speaker, Dr. Jeffrey S. So. morning. I just want to thank the Philippine Urological Association for inviting me to lecture at the Urology Practice Hacks 2.0. So I'll be tackling common dilemmas that are usually encountered between urologists and pathologists and sometimes we have some form of mis miscommunication and want to clarify those. So this will be the outline for the lecture. I have six topics. Hopefully at the end of the day, I'll be able to clarify some things and we'll have better communication between the urologists and the pathologists. So we start out with diagnosing small foci of atypical glands that, that we try to diagnose as prostatic adenocarcinoma. Uh, I always start out with the normal histology of the prostate and this is what we usually get. We get simple glands that sometimes are undulating that have two, two cell types. Uh, commonly, you have your basal cell and, of course, your luminal cell. There are certain, certain pathognomonic features when we're talking about prostate cancer. And when we say pathognomonic, these are absolute indicators of malignancy. You don't see it in any form of any benign entity. So it could either be perineural invasion, which most urologists would know, would also be an indicator of a higher chance of extraprostatic extension. But mo for most pathologists, if you see a nerve, bundle such as this being surrounded by glandular proliferation that really favors or is an absolute indicator of, again of malignancy. Next would be glomeruloid formation. Uh, for most pathologists when we have this cribriform structure attached to one point to the wall of an atypical gland this is automatically cancer and this is also automatically pattern four or gleason uh, pattern four cancer. You can also have mucin extravasation. A normal prostatic glands would not produce mucin. So if you have mucin, even if it's intraluminal, then you're suspicious for cancer. But they're absolutely cancerous if all of that mucin, which we see here, this violet material, goes out into the surrounding stroma. Then that would be uh, malignancy. Next is mucinous fibroplasia, which is related to mucin extravasation. You have these fine fibrillary areas that are a reaction to the foreign body material. In this case, that's mucin inducing this collagenous sphere nodules, which is the other name for mucinous fibroplasia. And again, an absolute indicator for malignancy. The problem with most of these cases is that you frequently don't see any of these features. You only see them in about 5% of prostatic adenocarcinoma cases. So where do most pathologists rely their diagnosis on? They rely their diagnosis on the softer features of prostatic adenocarcinoma. That's why it's a very delicate balancing act in trying to figure out if you do have malignancy or not, especially in very small focus. So what happens if we're not sure? We tend to call them certain terms. These are your borderline lesions. I tend to prefer a typical gland suspicious for carcinoma over ASAP, but they're one and the same. Why do I prefer a typical gland? Because it does not connote, it doesn't imply that it's like an absolute diagnosis. We're basically saying we're not sure. It could either be malignant or it could be benign where most pathologists would be 50-50. Uh, second, if I just say typical glands, I can further explain why they're typical. Oftentimes, I would uh, write or include in the surgical pathology report the reason why it's atypical. I would say 
I can't rule out high grade pain. I can't rule out hypnosis, or I can't rule out uh, uh, atrophy. Okay, making the diagnosis of the typical glands uh, easier to explain. So, based on literature, an atypical diagnosis or ASAP should be rendered in about 0.7% to 23.4% of cases, with an average of approximately 5%. That 5% is usually for our super experts. I can't get that low. Based on is it being rendered judiciously or warranted in our country, uh, I made a study with one of my mentors before, before leaving for fellowship, and we were able to find out that before I came back, in St. Luke's, we were rendering about almost 31% of our cases as atypical. That's about one third of cases. And that's pretty high, which is uh, contradictory to what should be diagnosed as atypical in literature. And among these atypical diagnoses, uh, only 27% turned out to be cancer. That's a pretty low number. So when I came back, we tried to actually improve on diagnosing and being judicious in diagnosing atypical glands. And we were able to do that. How did we do it? Uh, we, we, we tried to actually check all of our pre-analytical variables. So we have to make sure that you're using buffered formalin. Uh, easier said than done. Some laboratories don't buffer their formalin, so it's not 10% buffered formalin. What happens is that your tissue is overfixated, making cutting of these paraffin blocks very difficult for our medical technologists. So instead of having a two centimeter um, tissue, what's left of you is about a centimeter. And if that area that was pretty uh, overfixed uh, is not cut properly, we may miss the area of cancer. And of course, if you buffer it properly, antigenic expression for immune histochemical staining, such as PIN4, will be easier and more optimal. Next, you separate your course ideally in indiv individual containers. Nowadays, uh, versus a few years ago, a lot of you now are really separating their, their, in their individual containers. So multiple cores, it helps that we can have multiple planes of section. We don't consume, again, the focus of prostate cancer. You have to remember, if you're putting like five cores in one paraffin block, this is for our medical technologists, then your tendency is you might overcut some of those tissues. Again, you might overcut the focus of cancer. And if there's any typical diagnosis, it's easier to do a repeat if they are in their individual containers. For example, instead of just saying it's in the left and right lobe, you're able to say it's in the left posterior apex. So if there's a saturation biopsy needed or a repeat biopsy needed, uh, most of you can go back to that particular area and saturate that area instead of just saturating the entire left or right. Two deeper step section. Some pathologists would not do this because they're afraid that they have such a thin tissue. So, but I found out that if you do step sections or deeper section, it saves a lot of money, especially to the patient. You don't need any immune, immune stuff stains. And of course, as a pathologist, you should be able to recognize common benign mimickers of prostate cancer, such as atrophy. It could either be partial, post-atrophic, or even simple atrophy, adenosis, high-grade pin, and central zone histology. All of these I see in my practice, especially when I get consult cases, being diagnosed as atypical. If you're used to seeing these lesions, you lessen the chance of you rendering an atypical diagnosis and giving insight to your patient. Um, one of the last ones that we could usually uh, utilize would be using immunohistochemical stains. Uh, those of you that uh, send consult cases to me know that I really use stains in order for me to actually diagnose small foci of prostate cancer, especially those who are, who are candidates for radical prostatectomy. So in the traditional method, you have P63, high molecular weight CK, and Amakar as separate stains. But now we're fortunate enough that we have the cocktail pin, pin 4. What's the advantage? Before we had three stains, three separate slides. The problem with that on the third stain, you might actually overcut the tissue and you're left with nothing, no more atypical focus. And that renders the staining mood and academic. So you're again left in a typical diagnosis. But now because of the pin four cocktail stain, which you have here with different colors indicating the different stains, we as pathologists are able to actually diagnose them in a single slide. Less chance of overcutting the tissue. So again, they're the same price, the difference is that we are able to render our diagnosis easier in one or in a single slide. And of course, the last option, even for me, uh, some would consider me uh, the last option when it comes to uh, a typical diagnosis. Personally, if I still have a difficult time diagnosing a small focus as prostate cancer, I still seek help uh, from a second opinion from a colleague. It never hurts to show your case to another person. 
And of course, you could do repeat biopsy. I usually um, suggest a repeat biopsy for cases when that focus is too small for me to actually do immunohistochemical stains. I don't force it because I, have, I always have to remember that immunohistochemical stains are just a supportive ancillary procedure for me to diagnose prostate cancer. They're not the end all be all. So if I call anything atypical, and I'm, uh, usually I'm about 80 to 90% sure that is prostate cancer. I just want to have a little more help in diagnosing it just because especially for those people who are pretty young and will undergo radical prostatectomy. I don't want to be surprised and suddenly you don't have anything on your radical prostatectomy specimen. So the average risk of cancer following an atypical diagnosis is about 41% with a median of 38.5%. So next would be proper Gleason scoring. All of you know I've been lecturing this for so long and I still see some uh, suboptimal Gleason scoring on some of my consult cases. So as a review, this is the left, the one on the left is the classic image of your Gleason scoring. Of course, it's not terribly different from any grading system that you have with uh, other tumors, but the novelty of this, of course, is that you have numbers, okay? A lot of the changes have occurred in pattern three and pattern four. So this is the progression or the evolution of your Gleason scoring system. In 1991, about one fourth of pathologists rendered the diagnosis of Gleason score two to four, uh, decreased to 2.4% in 2001, and currently it's 0%. I'm glad to know that here in the Philippines, I'm seeing less and less people diagnosing Gleason two to four. It's about less than five to 10% of my consult cases now, versus when I was doing uh, or starting my practice, about one third of people were still diagnosing Gleason patterns. Uh, just as a reminder, of course, and I'm pretty sure most of you urologists would know versus pathologists, they don't know this much, but a pure Gleason 6 cancer should not metastasize. So the traditional scoring method would incorporate the most common pattern as the first pattern, and the secondary pattern would be the next most common pattern. Very logical, easy to do. However, this does not take into consideration the fact that you can have a third pattern present within the core. So what do we do now? If you have a third pattern present, the primary is still the most common pattern, and the secondary would be the worst pattern left. As an example, if we have a four such as this, the blue area, the 60% decent pattern four that remains the same, it's the most common or most commonly prevailing pattern. And the secondary pattern would be either pattern three or pattern five. So even if pattern five is only 10%, now in the updated scoring, this would be four plus five equals nine. Before this was called four plus three equals seven. And as we all know, four plus three equals seven and four plus five equals nine have a very different cancer-specific survival. So um, this is a contemporary prostate cancer grading system, um, a new supposedly grading system, but now it's been out for a lot of years now. But it started out the Hopkins group, and it was based on almost 20,000 cases from a large cohort from Johns Hopkins Memorial Sloan Kettering, Karolinska, University of Pittsburgh, and Cleveland Clinic. It accurately stratified, uh, stratifies prognosis and still based on the principles of the decent scoring system. Why is there a need? There's patient benefit. Uh, easier to explain to the patient, of course. Uh, it's a spectrum of one to five. Versus, for some example, with the too many permutations of your decent scoring, you have more than 20 permutations. 1 plus 2, 2 plus 1, 3 plus 3. It's easier to explain now. Um, assumed behavior for various decent scores is not accurate. It does not take into consideration some of the variants of your prostatic adenocarcinomas. And it's more of a prognostic grade proof. So as we all know, and I always put this after my report, if I have any malignancies, it's divided into five. Before, uh, a lot of us thought that decent seven was homogenous, same behavior. But as we all know, most studies would always, would have some, uh, some studies would actually include three plus four equals seven in their active surveillance protocol. So these are just your kaplan meyer curves showing again the division based on biochemical recurrence free survival of your five prognostic rate groups. And it's the same across the board when it comes to biopsies and your radical prostatectomy specimen. So I was fortunate enough to be included in this white paper by the Genital Urinary Pathology Society. 
and it actually encompasses a lot of the grading and the contemporary grading that we do now, answering some questions that we have with all the developments that we've had in prostate biopsies. Okay, specifically MRI-targeted prostate biopsies. It's far superior to systemic prostate biopsy for identifying high-grade prostate cancer. So as a caveat, we all know that a minority of cases uh, may be um, uh, high-grade tumors in a minority of cases may be missed. Uh, a consensus statement by the AUA and the Society of Abdominal Radiology recommends that at least two cores are obtained from each MRI suspic suspicious lesion. In order to prevent tissue fragmentation, it was also recommended that no more than two cores are placed in a single container. So hopefully we can do this moving forward. A uh, particular problem that we have when we're talking about MRI target, targeted biopsies, especially for pathologists, would be if we have multiple cores or multiple fragments in a single container, which can happen. Some of you I know, I know um, actually take a lot of areas in the suspicious, let's say, Pyrads 5, Pyrads 4 nodule. And in this case, if it turns out to be malignant, uh, there's a conundrum for us pathologists. If these are the cores that I got from that container, and I see all of them bearing malignancy, they could have different lesions for us. The question here is that, what do you do? Do you do an aggregate or the individual highest lesion score? Um, there is no current recommendation uh, from actually our society. It's more of a consensus. Some studies have shown nice results, but still some contrad contradictory results. I'll just tell you what I actually do, and hopefully it is appropriate for your practice. I know from the traditional stance, we usually actually go for the highest lesion score. However, as you can see here, it's pretty obvious that you have more three than the four. So if this was the individual highest score that we're taking, then we have a Gleason 8. However, in aggregate, this would be Gleason 3 plus 4 equals 7. Based on my experience, and this could be purely anecdotal, the tendency is if you do radical prostatectomy cases in this specimen, you would get a Gleason score 7 rather than a Gleason score 3. However you want to interpret that, I leave it up to you. There was a nice study actually showing um, some results, some different results when you're trying to um, define which is the optimal method for reporting prostate cancer grades on MRI-guided biopsies that are frequently fragmented. Uh, it was a study from Dr. Gordetsky, and it compared an aggregate reporting method versus an individual core reporting method. And based on her results, it showed that aggregate better predicted extraprostatic extension, but it's still inconclusive in the final grade. I'm pretty sure, and I know Dr. Gordetsky, they will do follow-up studies on this. So hopefully they could clarify more if using the aggregate would be more concordant when you're dealing with your radical prospective specimens. So the current consensus would be report the grades of each course separately as long as they are submitted in separate containers, or the course are in the same container yet specified by the urologist as to their location, different ink, uh, different colored inks. In the setting of multiple undese undesignated course with cancer in one container, an overall grade, which I do currently, is given the, for the course in a specific container as if all the involved cores were one long core. And when multiple undesignated cores are taken from a single MRI-targeted lesion, report the aggregate grade, total number of cores involved by cancer, and overall aggregate tumor extent. So next would be dealing with poorly differentiated carcinoma of the prostate or the bladder. I think those urologists who've gotten some of the reports from me uh, even if you say it's from the bladder tissue, uh, bladder tissue or prostate tissue, if I see something so poorly differentiated, never giving a hint that it's actually glandular or urethelial, I tend to just say diagnose, uh, I just tend to give a diagnosis of poorly differentiated carcinoma and I request for stains. Uh, we all know that the urinary bladder is known to be commonly involved with tumor extension from adjacent organs. Though the prostate is not commonly involved with metastatic lesions, bladder tumors commonly extend to the prostate, which we have to rule out. So this is an example of a bladder tumor that is supposedly, uh, we, we tend to think that it's immediately from the urethelial uh, lining. However, as you, uh, I'll show you here on the right side, this is your urethelial lining, and there is no exophytic lesion. There's no papillary lesion. Second, there's no atypia that may indicate that you have an in situ uh, carcinoma. All you have are these nests and sheets of neoplastic cells invading the lamina propria and most probably the muscularis propria. Uh, 
so the picture here shows that most probably the tumor is coming from outside rather than from the over, overlying urothelial lining. That tends to favor something as metastatic or tends to favor something that may be from the prostate if the patient is male. So we use stains. These are the frequently requested stains that I asked for. Gatatri, a urothelial marker. It's a bit promiscuous, meaning it can stain for a lot of tumors. But when you're talking about just prostate versus urothelial, it has a, it has a pretty high sensitivity and specificity rate. Uh, 80 to 90 percent. So there's a good internal control here showing positive staining by the brown stain. That's your urothelium. So that's a good indicator that it's working. And all of the lesion that we're thinking of as urothelial is negative. Another stain that we could use would be high molecular weight cytokeratin or even P63. They're positive here, the high molecular weight CK, and it's negative on the atypical focus. So we use PSA. Uh, to try to check out if it is indeed, indeed prostatic. So what we see here is there's a slight blush. It's not so intense. Why? Because it's fully differentiated. I frequently see a lot of tumors that are fully differentiated, supposedly from the prostate, that don't express PSA in, anymore, even at the serum level. So that's why this next stain, which is pretty new, is your NKX 3.1, is uh, highly valuable. Because even if your PSA is negative, you can actually use it to indicate prostatic etiology. As we can see here, it's a nuclear state, it's positive. So that favors a prostatic tumor involving the bladder. Another stain that you could use, which we don't uh, use anymore, is prostine just because of the lack of uh, demand. But it's also an adjunctive stain that I used before when we still had the supply. So another example would be a prostate tumor. Um, some would go hook, line, and sinker and think that this would be something that is prostatic and just call it these on 5 plus 5 equals 10 prostatic adenocarcinoma. However, as you can see, you don't see any glandular architecture. So you, uh, you have to be suspicious that this might be coming out from uh, another site, particularly the bladder. And we stained it, and all of the prostatic markers are negative. What were positive were the urethelial markers. So this would be infiltrating high-grade urethelial carcinoma involved in the prostate. So what are my recommendations or conclusions? If dealt with a poorly differentiated carcinoma on either prostatic or bladder biopsy, it is highly recommended to subject the tumor to an initial panel of stains. Even if it's said to be prostate and you're highly suspicious for something prostatic, if it's fully differentiated, I will ask for at least four of these stains. Commonly, I ask for PSA, NKX 3.1, GATA3, and high molecular weight cytokine. Next would be diagnosing high-grade pin. So in the Philippines, it's seldom reported. And in, when it's reported, it's sometimes reported in the obsolete manner that it shouldn't be done anymore. It's often unrecognized and frequently misdiagnosed. It's present in about, and this is pretty consistent, in about 5 to 8% of TRUS biopsies. So what, are, what is PIN? It's architecturally benign prostatic glands lined by cytologically typical cells. The easiest way that I explain it to my residents is that they look malignant, meaning the individual cells, but the architecture is totally benign. Okay. High-grade pinnate cancers share the similar chromosomal anomalies like telomere shortening, alterations, members of the BCL2 genes, etc. It is not CIS because it has a lower rate of progression as compared to other organs. We do not report low-grade pin, poor re reproducibility, and there's no clinical significance. The only time I report low-grade pin is that when someone calls it high-grade pin, I try, I try to help him out and say that it's more of a low, lowish-grade pin than true high-grade pin. The only difference between low-grade pin and high-grade pin is that it should have, meaning the high-grade pin has a large prominent nucleolus or nucleoli. How prominent should it be? For us pathologists, it should be visible at 20x magnification. Okay? These are examples of high-grade pin, the ones on top, and this is low-grade pin. So what we're looking for are these dot-like structures, which are your nucleoli. If we see them at 20x magnification or 200x, including uh, anyway, 20x magnification, then that will be a diagnosis of high-grade pin. Just to further emphasize those nucleoli that we're looking for. So most studies have shown if there's only one core positive for high-grade pin, it does not help predict which men are at higher risk of having cancer, even if you use your PSA, age, and family history. It doesn't help. Of the 22 studies of the risk of cancer following a diagnosis of high-grade pin, on one court that were published in 2000 or uh, year 2000 or later, 
there was about 24.1% chance that you would have cancer in the subsequent biopsy versus the average risk of finding cancer in a repeat biopsy following benign diagnosis would be about 20%. So there's no great statistical significance versus one core of high-grade pin repeating it with a repeat biopsy versus one with a benign diagnosis and you repeat the biopsy. When does high-grade pin then become significant? It becomes significant when you have more than two cores of high-grade pin even in the same location, as long as they're two separate tissues. There, it, it's reasonable to recommend repeat biopsy because the chances of finding cancer in repeat biopsy would be increased to 30 to 40 percent. So the recommendations when it comes to high-grade pin would be men do not need a routine repeat needle biopsy within, within the first year following the diagnosis of high-grade pin on one core. If it's multifocal high-grade pin on biopsy, repeat the biopsy two to six months after to reduce the chances of overlying inflammation, actually inducing a reactive change mimicking high-grade pin. It's reasonable to repeat biopsy at two to three years after limited one core high-grade pin since we don't know the long-term risk of cancer and medical legal issues if the patient is not follow-up. These are the sources for that. And second to the last would be the assessment of depth of invasion when it comes to invasive urothelial can cancers. So urothelial cancer can be invasive, as we all know, and this means that it's beyond the basement membrane. As a pathologist, it's pretty difficult for some to diagnose invasion just because we see so much fragmentation when you submit the specimen to us and a lot of coarse thermal artifacts secondary to pottery. So I personally teach the residents and tell them that even if it's fragmented, you can actually see if it's invasive or not by relying on four histologic features. Uh, first would be single cell infiltration. This is the overlying epithelium. And if you have single cells or small nests, that's favoring, again, invasion. If you have this retraction artifact, meaning a space around a small nest of cell, that also favors that this is something invasive beyond the basement membrane. Once the cells mature, to the bottom, meaning paradoxical maturation. Why paradoxical? Because the tumor should be, or the cell should be maturing to the top, not to the bottom. Excuse me. So if you have this, then that's also an indication of invasion. And lastly, it would be um, desmoplastic reaction. If you have this reaction to the surrounding invasive focus, then that again favors invasion. A potential pitfall for invasion would be urothelial tumors with involution or prominent inverted growth pattern. What does that mean? Some of the tumor may actually involute, just like your Schneiderian papilloma of the nasal cavity, and actually have large nests pushing into the lamina propria, but never going beyond the basement membrane. We, I personally report this as, for example, this is a non-invasive low-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma with prominent inverted growth pattern. I've seen some slide review consult cases given to me or sent to me, and these were called invasion. If you don't see the four patterns of invasion that I mentioned a while ago, even if you seemingly see a lot of these nests of cells within the lamina propria, this is still not invasion yet. Another potential pitfall would be overcalling muscle invasion. And as personally, as I've seen in my practice, with all the cases that I've seen uh, regarding uh, muscle, you always ask me if you had um, muscularis propria in the, in the sample that you gave me that you indicated as deep muscle bite. So for me, in order for me to call this as uh, muscularis propria, I have to see thick muscle bundles such as these. When I see just thin wispy muscles such as what I'm showing you here on the top, those would be muscularis mucosae. So again, I have to see this thick muscle bundles in order for me to call it the trusor muscle or muscularis propria. Again, to further highlight that, you see these thin muscle bundles, that's your muscularis mucosae. If I say propria, then I'm seeing these thick muscle bundles that the trusor muscle. So this is just an example of a plasma cytoid type urothelial carcinoma invading the detrusor muscle. Another example, so you have these small cells seemingly innocuous, seemingly inflammatory cells, but these are actually, again, plasma or radioid type of urothelial carcinoma, invading these thick muscle bundles of your detrusor muscle. And the last would be dealing with glandular neoplasms of the urinary bladder. Uh, glandular neoplasms of the urinary bladder are a broad spectrum of uh, lesions. If you're male, you can have lesions from the prostate and gastrointestinal tract. Uh, if you're female, some of the gynecological lesions can extend to the bladder. 
then they can either be, of course, primary or metastatic. We do have primary glandular or adenocarcinomas of the bladder. They can also be a focal component. Some urethelial carcinomas can have focal glandular differentiation, or they can also present as an in situ lesion. Invasive adenocarcinoma primary tumors of adenocarcinomas of the bladder represent around 2.5% of all malignant bladder tumors. As with other variants, they arise from divergent differentiation in urethelial carcinoma. Clinically, adenocarcinomas of the bladder are usually single discrete lesions. This is a fine example of adenocarcinoma. You don't see the tr transitional architecture that you associate with urethelial lining. You have these glandular structures invading, even having an in situ component. When I have, when, or when I see an in situ component that usually favors that this tumor is primary vesicle or primary urinary bladder in etiology. If I don't see any in situ lesion, that makes me suspect that most probably this tumor can be arising from adjacent organ tissue. So this is just a summary. I know it's a busy slide of the stains that we can actually utilize in actually differentiating between adenocarcinomas of the colorectal region and your urinary bladder. Why? It's because most of the tissues that we get from adenocarcinomas of the bladder really look morphologically similar to your gastrointestinal type. And the only thing that can usually be of help would be your beta catenia. Even then, it's poorly reproducible. That's why oftentimes I don't usually use stains. I usually call you up and ask you if, you, if you've done any uh, GI clearance or uh, uh, colonoscopic um, surveillance in order for us to rule out a colonic malignancy. If the gastrointestinal tract is clean, I would usually say that I favor a primary bladder adenocarcinoma over a metastatic lesion from the colorectal region. So again, I tend to actually shy away from using immunized metabolites. That was my last slide. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, thank you to all the organizing committee. Uh, hopefully, uh, this clarified a lot of things. And have a nice day. Stay, stay safe.